Today I'm joined by professional public speaker, business transformation consultant at IBM, and the host of Master Talk YouTube channel where you can learn how to master your public speaking abilities, Brendan Kuramasami. Thanks for having me, Mark. Great to be on. It is absolutely my pleasure. And just as a quick side note, it is about 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern here in uh, on a Friday evening. And for you, Brendan, to be working all day at IBM, transforming the business there and to say, you know what? I got to get on a show at 10 p.m. on a Friday. Props to you, man. That's what it's all about. I appreciate that, man. So I'm curious, going back uh, to when you first started your journey into teaching people how to execute public speaking, what was that moment you were like, I need to help people with this? When was that that light turn on for you? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was in university, I used to do these things called case competitions. So think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So all other guys my age, but you know, watch the college football game, play football, or interact with it. I, I obviously, as you can tell, uh, don't have much interest in sports, but... I still ate the same chicken wings and I still watched the games, <laughs> except the games weren't football games. They were other universities giving presentations. So it is a very bizarre world, but suffice to say, I did competitions in presentations. So for the, the next three years of my life in university, I presented over 500 times, coached over 75 people on to speak in public. And I, you know, I got my dream job in consulting and as I was looking at my life in reverse, I asked myself a very different question after I got out of poverty, which is the following. How can I use my time and expertise to serve the world? That's when the idea for the YouTube channel started because I realized a lot of the content out there wasn't really good. That's amazing. That's, that's a really kind of nice snapshot there because I think it's important. You know, People get so caught up and I have to impress everyone else. But if you stay true to yourself and what you love and what you enjoy, I, I really don't think you can go wrong. I'm also curious, you mentioned that you had to work your way out of poverty. Can you expand on that a little bit? How did you, what was your situation and what motivated you and, and what opportunities came from being in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I grew up in a, in a small suburb in Montreal, Canada, and I wasn't like dirt poor or anything, but I came from a, a low middle income household. So, you know, my, my parents were minimum wage workers. Uh, when I entered business school, when I was 19, I didn't really know anybody in the business world. Uh, one of the companies I used to work at called Price Waterhouse Cooper. So for those on the call, it's like this big accounting firm. I used to, I used to think it was a water bottling company. So, cause it had the word water in it. That's how lost I was. So I, I think what, what, what being in poverty or I guess not having the means to get anything that I wanted or to serve my needs in, in a great way, it forced me to, to pursue that money. And I think the idea is whenever you have a lack in an area, that's always what you want to get more of. So I had, you know, a mother who really loved me, who's very much still alive that I live with. I have a beautiful sister, but I think for me, it was more about how do I make sure that I can provide a living for these people? And that was my focus, right? We always start with surviving. And then after I was done surviving, then I started thriving. And then step by step, I was able to overcome. But I think what poverty gave me was a, definitely a chip on my shoulder that helped me execute all my future projects after. Yeah, I, I think you see that from a lot of the greats out there, the people that really over excel, they, they absorb that chip on their shoulder and, and they use that as fuel to ignite that fire, to put in that overtime, to put in that after hours effort, which I, I really respect. So- You've got this great job at IPM. You're a business transformation consultant. You're doing well there. You're growing within that company. Why decide to transition into video creation for YouTube? Why transfer into this program where you're helping people to do public speaking? Why, why do that on the side? Absolutely. And I, and I think it's funny because when I started making the YouTube channel and I started making videos in my basement, my mom was really scared. She was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Like you have this fancy job, like what's happening? And I had my phone and I was like, mom, don't worry. I'm just doing my thing. So, so why did I make that decision? To be honest with you, Mark, if I was born 30 or 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't have done that. You know, I'd be a senior executive at a company like I always wanted to be, whether it was IBM or really any of the other companies, you know, made a pretty good living for myself, had a decent family, would have lived normally. But I think because of the time that we're currently living in, all the stars kind of aligned. So I was when I was 22, a couple of weeks before I started working, I 
just asked myself the same question that everyone else was asking me, the people I was teaching in university. They just kept asking me, how did I learn how to speak over and over and over again? And I always responded with, well, I don't know. And the reason is because I didn't have the money for a speech coach, as you can probably like, right? Because I was in poverty. And, you know, Toastmasters was okay, but I didn't really have time for it and all that stuff. So, so I was mostly self-taught. So I was just curious because the 10th person kept asking me that I just started watching the YouTube videos. And then I realized how horrendous the content was. I was like, what is this? And, <laughs> and the reason I think for me, it really comes from a value system. Like when I started, you know, it was just for fun. I was trying to keep myself, you know, as less bored as I possibly could. But after I started working and Master Dark really started to pick up, I started to understand the bigger picture of why I was doing that. So, so one side of the equation is the generosity of the people who came before me. So the reason I was able to, just for the record, I started Master Dark when I was 22, right? And I, and I currently coach a lot of CEOs now, but I'm still in my early 20s. So why was I able to accumulate all of those no that knowledge very quickly? The reason was because going back to that generosity piece, a lot of podcasters like yourself were already very successful in life, but made the decision to start something like this just to help regular people who can't afford them. So the example that I like to give is Lewis Howes, who I'm a personal fan of. Sure. He has this podcast called The School of Greatness, and he already had a multi seven figure business before he started the podcast. But because he started at the moment that I turned 17, 18, I watched all of the episodes. And I was able to learn from that generosity and make a means for myself. So when I looked at my life and I said, if one day I ever have something important to share or something that needs to be shared, I should probably do it. And that's when Master Talk aligned because I just said, if I don't do it, who else is going to motivate the 16, 17 year olds to share a message that matters? And the answer is nobody. So, so that's what made me uh, get into yeah. YouTube a bit more seriously. I think you brought up a couple really important points there, one of which is – you, you need to find that purpose in life, right? And by by solving problems for people, it, it kind of keeps you going. I, I can definitely empathize you in the same way there, Brendan. Uh, the second thing you brought out is I kept getting, getting asked the same questions over and over. Make a YouTube video. That way you can just say, hey, watch this video and then we can have them, we can take the next step in the conversation. So I, I really love that. So you've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of people in how to improve their public speaking. And I have found that one of the biggest issues that people have when learning how to public speak is fear. They're afraid to get up there. So what do you tell someone who's afraid to get up and start talking to people? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm so passionate about this, just for the record. When I, when I was growing up in a suburb in Montreal, I went to a French education system. And the reason is because French is a required language in our city. So it's not too far off New York City. Mm -hmm. But here's the issue, Mark. The first 15 years of my life, not only was I uncomfortable with presentations, I had to give presentations in a language I didn't even know. Wow. Right? Because I was in seventh grade or fifth grade or second grade, and I would have to give presentations in French. So obviously today, you know, I keynote in French and I do well in the language, but at the time it was horrifying. So I definitely- Who pushed you? I'm curious. Who pushed you to, to do that? That sounds very, very challenging. Yeah, yeah. My parents did. And thank God they did. And yeah. the reason they did that was because I needed to learn the French language because French is like a man, like it's, it's a city where people speak multiple languages at the same time. So if you don't know French in the city, you aren't going to be successful here. And that's why I'm very grateful that they pushed me, even if they didn't want to do it because they, you know, they were kind of worried about how I was going to adapt. They said, we you know we got to push this kid through. Or else, how, what is he going to do? And I'm so grateful they did that. So, you know, I was able to get a really nice job out of university because of that. All the stars kind of aligned. But I think the the point that I'm driving here is if there's anything I learned from my experience is to help people cope with the fear by understanding where it comes from. Because for, for some reason, you know, we're we're all scared of public speaking, but we don't really know why. So let me clarify that once and for all, because everyone else has done a pretty bad job with it, but pretty honest. So let's break this down in simple terms. Where do we give most of our presentations? And the answer for almost everybody is the schooling and education system. We don't wake up one morning, Mark, and go, hey, man, you want to get breakfast and present all day? Like, that's right. not a thing, right? What happens is we're sitting in history class together. Our teacher comes up to us and says, well, Mark, I need you to do a presentation on the Renaissance. And you're sitting there wondering, like, what is this thing, like a fruit? <laughs> then you find out later it's a time period in history. You present the presentation, but you realize three different things. One, 
we generally never get to present topics that we're passionate about or enthusiastic about. Two, students don't care about our presentation, not because they don't care about us. They generally like us because they are worried about their own presentation. You're always presenting to students who have a presentation right after you present, right? So they're always in their own head. So they're obviously not paying attention to you. And then number three, you have a teacher who's very well-educated, very well-intentioned. I have a lot of respect for teachers, but they're very stressed. They got 40 presentations to go through. They don't have time to sit you down for 10 minutes and say, hey, Mark, let's talk about your presentation for a couple of minutes, how you can improve. But here's the punchline. This behavior, picking topics we're not passionate about, presenting to students who don't care, to teachers who are too stressed to coach us, gets perpetuated over and over again in history, math, English, arts, music, science, gym, over and over. We're taught to believe that public speaking is a chore. Public speaking is tied to a grade. Public speaking is an obligation rather than what public speaking is supposed to be to make a difference in the world like we're doing right now. That's where the issue stems. Not because we suck at public speaking, because trust me, I sucked. The key is that we need to shift our mindset from public speaking being a bad thing. Oh, work, I got this work presentation to something that makes a difference. I love that. And Brendan here just broke down three real, real reasons why you might be afraid to pub to, to speak publicly for no reason at all. You can find out more great tips on his YouTube channel, Master Talk. Great stuff. So Brennan, let's let's dive in a little bit deeper. Let's take this to the next level, okay? Um, I think the bottom line is in order to be successful over the, the coming years, decades, public speaking is gonna be extremely important, right? I think that you're seeing, like you had mentioned before, people like Lewis Howes, already millionaire and decides, I'm going to get into public speaking and talking on YouTube and people like Gary V and, um, and it, it just, there's a lot of people that are getting into this big public speaking where they don't have to. Okay. And, and I think that they see just like you saw that there's an immense opportunity to multiply in instead of doing one-on-one -on -one conversations, but to have one conversation with thousands, millions potentially of people. So Let's talk a little bit about how that manifests itself. Right now we're moving into the digital age, coronavirus is happening. How is public speaking on the internet different from actually speaking with an, a live audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's break that down once again in simple terms. So let's say we're giving an in-person workshop, I'm you know, standing in front of you, Mark, I'm giving a presentation. It's very easy for me to tell, if I use a joke as an example, whether or not you laugh. So mm. let's say I say a joke, you're either going to say, ha you know, Brendan, you're such a funny guy. Or you're going to say, man, this dude is not funny. <laughs> but either way, I can gauge your reaction. I can see how you're reacting to me. So that next time when I give you a workshop, if I am funny, I'll say more jokes. And if I'm not funny, I won't. But here's the challenge in public speaking, especially in the online world, is that same joke that I gave in person, the same joke that with the enthusiasm, the energy, you need to say it and assume it's funny hmm. because now in this new world, you can't see how someone's reacting. Sure, I can tell how you're reacting to me in this screen because we're one-on-one, -on -one, but there's two issues. One, I'm not actually directly looking at you. I'm actually looking at the lens. So it appears that I'm looking at you, even if not I'm not. Tip. Right? <laughs> and yeah, exactly. I guess, I guess it just comes out as we, as we talk. <laughs> but the second thing, is you're usually not presenting to one person. You're presenting to like 50. If you got 50 little screens, you, you can't tell if anyone's laughing. Think about you know the talk show hosts who, who are sitting in their basement who have to assume that they're funny. That's the challenge. So in person is actually easier than online. But the benefit, the opportunity that awaits us is if you're really good at presenting online, you are going to tear when you go back into the in-person world. So my advice to kind of help you think through this is get the five people that you hate the most, and I seriously mean this, bring them on a Zoom call on a webinar and have them shred you, like give you really harsh feedback. <laughs> oh, Brendan, you know, your sound's off, your hair's not cut, you're not well-dressed, your lighting's off, and you know, the way that you present your slides. So when you actually give the presentation, it's half decent. When you go back into in-person, you're going to be amazing.
Wow, that's that's powerful. I don't know if I'm ready for that sort of uh, criticism just yet, but I, I, I think that that's something that can be really hard because the reality is if you're posting content online, you're going to get haters. People Absolutely. are going to be like, you look dumb. That was stupid. It's not funny. Um, but taking it with a grain of salt and moving past it, but also I think learning when when it is actually good advice is is important too. But man, I'll tell you what, constructive criticism is very, very difficult to come by. One of the things that I've noticed that you do, Brendan, that, that I really like is I've, I've listened to you on a few different podcasts and you you seem to always understand the demographic and the psychographic of the people that are going to be listening to your presentation. How mm -hmm. important is it for us as speakers to know who our audience is? Right. And I love that you talked about this. Let's kind of break that down. So let's compare what average speakers do. So people who have a presentation to give and they see it more as a chore versus someone where their life's obsession is like, let's like, let's do something great here. The difference is simple. Speakers in general think about their audience. Oh, I wonder who's going to be there. I wonder who's going to be sitting in the room. I wonder who's going to be giving a speech. But the best speakers talk to them obsess over them, understand their very psychology, understand their dreams, their hopes, what they aspire to become, and play to that message. So if I use as a concrete example for people, I grab a lot of dinners, a lot of lunches, breakfast, small chit chat in the hallway of the people that I'm trying to make an impact for. And that gives me a lot more insight than you would think. And I'll give a concrete example to demonstrate this. A lot of speech coaches in my industry, because they, I believe they're very disconnected from their audience, they generally start with a lot of statistics when they start. So it sounds something yeah. like this. Did you know, Mark, that after death, public speaking, fear is the greatest thing that humans fear of all time. Is that right? Maybe. <laughs> Does that help your audience? Let's break that down. If your goal if what you aspire to do in this workshop is to inspire them to take a chance, to take a leap, to do something cool, to share a message, whether it's a big one or just a cupcake recipe, the last thing you want to do is compare it to death. Right? That's, that's an interesting point because it puts them I – th I think a lot of communication speaking is all about emotion, right? And so you're evoking an emotion of fear and holy crap, I got to get out of this room, right? Exactly. Right. So like, just to build on that because I love what you're saying there, the number one thing that I get from my audience, whether it's 10-year-old Rebecca who's tucking my shirt and asking for confidence to be a speaker, all the way up to senior executive Tim or, a, or you know Julia at a Fortune 500, it's the same message throughout, which is, Brendan, I can't be you. And I always reply, what do you mean you can't be me? Why not? And they always say, well, because you know, you're a speaker, I'm not really a speaker. And I go, no, 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 no. That's when I had to change my message. Because at the beginning, when I was starting to present, I had a lot of insecurity. And this is coming from a guy who's presented hundreds of times, right? I had a lot of insecurity because I was a 22-year-old kid presenting to senior execs. So I used to gloat a lot about my accomplishments in my intros. And then I realized that it wasn't helping me because it was putting me higher and higher up on a pedestal that mm. nobody wanted to aspire for. And I just said, shit, like I need to change this. But then when I swapped my introduction and I started saying, Hey, you know, when I was five, I pretty much messed up all my presentations my whole life. Then the message changed. Then people started watching the videos. And that's when I understood the importance of not just thinking about my audience intellectually, but speaking to them directly. Yeah, I like that. I, I think that's really smart. And, and that's definitely something a lot of public speakers do is they go in there and the challenge is you want to present yourself as an expert in a particular field, right? And part of that is stating the accomplishment that you have. But like you've kind of eloquently put it here, Brendan, if, if you lean too heavily on that, too heavily onto the problem, too heavily onto what you've accomplished in your years on earth, it'll make it very difficult for you to actually create that emotional connection with your audience. That's, that is really, that is really, really smart. I like that a lot. Appreciate it. Is there is there anything that you have done as a speaker to gain confidence? So if I'm going into a talk, maybe I'm I'm I, I don't do a lot of these public speaking engagements. Maybe it's a a school presentation. Let's say that I'm interested in at least. What what are some tips, some tools, some tactics that I can use or employ 
to gain confidence so that I can get up there, shoulders back, and actually belt out some valuable information. Absolutely. So I'm definitely different than most people that would say, you know, you got to drink a glass of water or breathe a couple of seconds. That doesn't work. Okay. That doesn't actually focus on the core issue, which is, you know, you're uncomfortable with this presentation. It's something that you can't get out. So now that we understand where the fear comes from, let's figure out how to fix it now and how to kind of reverse engineer that. This is what I called the repeatable presentation. So if you think about learning a new skill in general, whether it's, you know, playing a piano or, you know, knowing how to shoot like a basketball in a, in a, like a net or something. Let's use piano to kind of make this more uh, generalized here. Sure, you can like practice 50 songs or you can do one 50 times and then show off to your friends at galas or something that you know how to play piano. And then through their validation, that's going to give you that quick win, that confidence boost to say, hey, let me try another song. Let me try a fourth song, a seventh song, then you're on your way. But we don't actually apply that analogy that we apply for literally every other skill in public speaking. It's Wednesday. Our boss, our client, our teacher says, Mark, I need you to give me a presentation for Friday. And you go, okay, it looks like I'm ignoring the family for the next couple of days. And then you, <laughs> you get the presentation together, put some slides up together. It's Friday. You put in 15 hours of work. You present it. And then you take the presentation. You crumble it up, toss it in the dustbin and then go to the next presentation. Whereas the best speakers in the world, especially Gary Vee, because I love you mentioned it, I like mentioning him a lot of shows. Literally the same thing for 12 years. So guys, uh, grew up in the Soviet Union, came down to the States. You guys got any questions or what? He gets paid 100, 120 grand now, I think. That's around his speaking fee to do that. That's the point I'm driving. What happens is when you do the same presentation over and over again, you start to ask yourself very different questions. So in the first version where you're kind of doing like all of these different presentations, the question is always the same. What type of content should I put in this thing? What type of content should I put in this thing? What type of, and then it's just always the same question. But if you're presenting the same thing a hundred times, now you're asking yourself something different. What emotions am I conveying here? Am I communicating to Mark in a way that can actually reach people or am I still being boring? Oh, it's 10 p.m. I should probably bring up my energy levels since I know my content now. The messaging... The questions we're asking is different. One pushback that I want to add here, and this dives into confidence, is, well, Brendan, I work at a bank. There's nothing repeatable about that. I can't just present all of this. This is boring. What do I do? I, let's call her Julia for the sake of this example. And I go, okay, Julia, what do you do outside of work? And then she might say things like, you know, I love to run marathons. I'm really good at that. I practice a lot. You know, I take care of my kids and I love them. Or... I don't know. I like to bake like cupcakes. She likes different recipes. You know, she likes, you know, she has, a, she's on a keto diet, things like that. So what I would tell Julia is I would say, you just gave me three repeatable presentations. So then Julia's confused. She says, what do you mean? And I go, well, one, you could talk about marathons and how it transformed your life. Two, you could talk about parenting tips to help aspiring parents who really have no clue what they're about to embark on. And you have a lot more experience than them. And three, you can talk about the diet plans you're on, the recipes you're using, and your favorite one. All it takes is presenting to three people, like I did the first time I presented my keynote, and one of those people to say, hey, Julia, that marathon journey of yours, your journey there really inspired me. I went for a run this morning, and then Julia's hooked. So how does this tie into confidence? I know I'm riffing for a long time here. I'll be quick. <laughs> but the idea with, with confidence is it stems from a belief system and it stems from what you're actually trying to achieve. Not the glass of water, not the, oh, blah, 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 what am I going to do? But rather, what are we doing this for? What are we trying to fight for here? And if we're fighting for 10 more people to go for a run rather than 10 more people to listen to us at a bank, then we're on the right track. Yeah, so and I think I'm 100% on board there with repeating and refining your story. I, I think people sometimes underestimate, I even underestimate uh, myself, it's something that I'm continuously working on is how can I refine my story to create that emotional connection and in, in, in creating that that level of mastery, right? You know, you play that one song over and over and over again. Don't move on to the next song until you've mastered it, right? Because then you can start adding in different different effects and, and impacts and and kind of and kind of tweak it a little bit. I mean, I think at the end of the day, something like a banker, you're not really a salesperson. You're in the relationship business. And I think a, a lot of people miss out on that. Listen, I, I can't um, 
at as much value as Brendan can to this, but you can definitely find out more at Master Talk, Brendan's YouTube channel, where he is producing new videos every Sunday, every Sunday. So Brendan, I got another question for you. Zoom is kind of like the thing now. Everyone's on Zoom and quite frankly, with kids uh, and teachers and businesses all going virtual now, how do you see speaking and engaging evolving here over the coming years as digital communication via Zoom becomes so prevalent? Right. So I think what's going to be more interesting, so as you alluded to, Mark, the way that we're presenting is has changed really rapidly. So if you take me, I went from an in-person keynoter to a keynoter in my basement, right? So, you know, you guys, you got to adapt. You're not speaking to, you know, the same 500 people that you used to. You're still, they're still there, but they're not actually there anymore. So how is this going to transition? So I think there's a couple of things for people to keep in mind. One is in-person is always going to be relevant. You know, we're, we're going to go back. We don't know when, yeah. right? We're going to go back eventually. So you always want to prepare for that world as you're practicing the online world because it'll make you better of them. Second is video is going to be more important and podcasting like we're doing right now is going to be essential if you want to build a personal brand. Like in many ways, podcasting is the new blog and videos is a great way for you to differentiate and share your message. But it's much more easier for you to, to share my story and to know more about me versus if I wrote an article yeah. right? because you wouldn't actually have that personal touch or that personal vocal variation in my tone. So which brings it to the third one. Now of all time is the best time in the world to practice. I'm currently in the process now of writing my content for the next five years. Why am I doing that? The reason is because, well, one, I want to democratize all the communication information, but B, I don't have to fly anymore. So I might as well use the hours I got back to spend more time with my family for sure, but also knock out all of my content. So when the gates open again, I don't have to write content until I'm like 32 or something. So you want to take advantage of this. If you're someone who's very serious content creator like you are, Mark, sure, you want to batch a couple of episodes. But that also applies if you're a beginner. If you're someone who's just like, oh, you know, I'm not sure about camera. If there's any time not to be sure, it's now. Like, do it now. Try it now. What's video? one video going to change? You have a lot more time than you used to, so take advantage of it and share your ideas with the world. Yeah, you really have nothing to you, to lose. I think for me, the biggest fear is not the actual act of making a mistake. It's looking back 10, 20 years from now and being like, I missed I missed my opportunity because this is a really scary time, I think. Um, we're seeing a mass transition of jobs. We're seeing layoffs. We're seeing... Uh, new new industries, AI. The world is changing very rapidly. And one of the best things that you can do is show the initiative, put in a little bit of extra time, like on a on a Friday night, like Brendan and me here, um, but start getting comfortable with discomfort because no matter what you do, you're going to be uncomfortable. You might as well be uncomfortable on a productive basis. Brendan, thank you so much for sharing here. I want to get into a few rapid fire questions with you, but I want to remind everyone you can find out more tips, tools, and tactics on public speaking from Brendan's YouTube channel, Master Talk. Not complicated. Go to Master Talk and you can you can find out more about that. Cool. Brendan, so let's knock out a few questions here. Starting out a business, what is a must-have item that costs less than $50? Less than 50 bucks. 50 bucks. Um, I'll, I'll recommend a book here. I think it'll be easier. Uh, my favorite book of all time is Thirst by Scott Harrison. I think it's a great memoir on a guy who went from being a nightclub promoter, probably one of the biggest ones in New York City, to being the leading voice on water and sanitation. So I'd recommend the read. Wow. Love that. That's a powerful thing. Powerful thing. Of course. Um, subscription. What's a must-have subscription that, that you couldn't live without? So what must have subscribed? I would say Audible for sure. I, I've just been obsessed with audiobooks and just I think I smash like one book a week now, just just because it's so efficient. So I'd recommend an Audible one. Love that. I had a uh, hugely successful podcaster John Lee Dumas on my show, and that was his go-to subscription as well. So definitely check that. What are you What are you reading now? Or what are you listening to now? I'm 
I actually just finished a book recently. It was Winners Take All by Anand. It's like this idea of how the elite group are, are sort of talking about what philanthropy actually means and what they're actually doing in this space, which has been fascinating. Love it. Very cool. Very cool. First, Last question here. Uh, Brandon, you have a billboard that can reach millions and millions of people. What are you going to put on your billboard? Yeah. So, so for me, it's definitely, and I think this is a good wrap up for the conversation is the following. Be insane or be the same. You know, if you want to be like everyone else, that's totally fine. But if you're listening to this show, there's probably a reason. You probably want to make a difference. You want to probably make an impact in the world. So my advice to you is learn to be a bit more insane. I mean, think about me, right? I started a YouTube channel when I was 22, not on comedy, not on vlogging, on communication and public speaking tips. I still live in my mother's basement. I have a six-figure salary, and I don't own a car. How does any of this make any sense? And I'm literally having this conversation while sitting on my mattress that I sleep on. None of this makes zero sense. But the punchline is it makes absolute perfect sense to the only person that matters, which is yourself. And I think the best way to step into your insanity and to do something different is to do the following exercise that I recommend on every show I'm on, which is to write your own funeral speech. I think it's given me a lot of clarity and it really helped me understand if you're in that casket, what do you want people to say about you? And then you'll be able to reverse engineer that and make a difference. Powerful, powerful words from a powerful speaker. Brandon Kumarasamy, thank you so much for your time, brother. Of course, my pleasure.